Thank you for downloading this Simon Schuster ebook. Join our mailing list and get updates on new releases, deals, bonus content and other great books from Simon Schuster. Click here to sign up or visit us online to sign up at ebooknews.simonanschuster.com. Contents Epigraph Soundtrack Introduction Chapter 1 Gentlemen or Thugs Chapter 2 Shit that's the Beatles. Chapter 3. A particular form of snobbery. Chapter 4. Yankophilia. Chapter 5. Politics and image craft. Chapter 6. Wheel dealing in the pop jungle. Epilogue. Photographs. Shout outs. About the author. Notes. Selected bibliography. Index. For my parents. The test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Soundtrack, Recommended, The Beatles, Shimmy Shake, 228, Live at the Star Club, Bo Diddley, Pretty Thing, 248, The Shields, Will You Love Me Tomorrow, 243, The Beatles, Love Me Do, 222, The Rolling Stones, Come On, 148, The Beatles, I Wanna Be Your Man, 2 O'Clock, The Rolling Stones, I Wanna Be Your Man, 149, The Beatles, Yesterday, 203, The Rolling Stones, As Tears Go By, 245, Bob Dylan, Girl from the North Country, 322, The Kinks, See My Friends, 250, The Bides, Bells of Rhymney, 335, The Animals, We Got to Get Out of This Place, 317, The Beatles, Drive My Car, 228, The Beatles, Norwegian Wood, This Bird Has Flown, 205, The Rolling Stones, Paint It, Black, 322, Stereo Album Mix, The Rolling Stones, Stupid Girl, 255, The Rolling Stones, Let's Spend the Night Together, 336, The Beatles, All You Need Is Love, 347, The Rolling Stones, We Love You, 435, The Rolling Stones, Street Fighting Man, 316, The Beatles, Revolution, 321, The Beatles, Hey Jude, 711, The Dirty Mac, Year Blues, 439, Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, Yoko Ono, Whole lot of Yoko, 503, Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, The Rolling Stones, Sympathy for the Devil, 852, Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, Introduction. In the summer of 1968, Mick Jagger attended a birthday party in his honor at a hip, new Moroccan style bar called the Vesuvio Club, one of the best clubs London has ever seen, remembered Tony Sanchez, one of its proprietors, under black lights and beautiful tapestries. Some of London's trendiest models, artists, and pop singers lounged around on huge cushions and took pulls from Turkish hookers, while a decorated helium-filled dirigible floated aimlessly around the room. As a special treat, Mick brought along an advance pressing of the Stones' forthcoming album, Beggar's Banquet, and when it played over the club's speakers, People flooded the dance floor. Just as the crowd was leaping around and celebrating the record which would soon win accolades as the best Stones album to date Paul McCartney strolled in and passed Sanchez a copy of the Beatles' forthcoming single, Hey Jude, Revolution, which had never before been heard by anyone outside of the group's charmed inner circle. As Sanchez remembered, the slow thundering build-up of a Hey Jude shook the club and the crowd demanded that the seven-minute song be played again and again. Finally, the club's disc jockey played the next song, and everyone heard John Lennon's nasal voice pumping out a revolution.as when it was over, Sanchez said. Mick looked peeved. The Beatles had upstaged him. It was a wicked piece of promotional one-upsmanship, remembered Tony Barrow, the Beatles' press officer. By that time, the mostly good-natured rivalry between the Beatles and the Stones had been going on for about four years. Although the Beatles were more commercially successful than the Stones, throughout the 1960s the two groups nevertheless competed for record sales, cultural influence, and aesthetic credibility. Teens on both sides of the Atlantic defined themselves by whether they preferred the Beatles or the Stones. If you truly loved pop music in the 1960s. 
there was no ducking the choice and no cop-out third option, one writer remarked, you could dance with them both, but there could never be any doubt about which one you'd take home. Initially the rivalry was strongest in England. The Beatles began inspiring mass adulation among young teenage girls in the spring of 1963, but it soon became apparent that the group's invigorating music and seductive charm worked on adults as well. The Fab Four couldn't quite win over everyone they were too unusual for that but conventional wisdom held that the Beatles were a wonderful tonic to a society that was finally ready to shed the last vestiges of Victorian era restraint. Their effect on British popular culture was said to be salutary, pitch perfect, and perfectly timed. The Rolling Stones provoked a different reaction. Pale and unkempt, they did not bother with stage uniforms, and they were not often polite. Instead of laboring to win the affection of the broader public, they feigned indifference to mainstream opinion. Musically, they favored American electric blues an obscure genre in England that was championed by adolescent males as well as females, and that was most suitably performed in dark and sweaty smoke-filled rooms. Those who were faint of heart, or who enjoyed a prim sense of propriety, knew to stay away from the stones. Adults regarded them as a menace. That is one of the reasons that the debate over which band was better, the Beatles or the Stones, was freighted with such deep significance. To say that you were a Beatles fan was to imply that, just like the Fab Four, you were well-adjusted, amiable, and polite. You were not a prig, necessarily but nor were you the type to challenge social conventions. For the most part, you conformed. You agreed. You complied. When you looked upon the world that you were bound to inherit, you were pleased. To align with the Rolling Stones was to convey the opposite message. It meant you wanted to smash stuff, break it and set it on fire. The Beatles want to hold your hand, journalist Tom Wolfe once quipped but the Stones want to burn down your town. Fans registered their loyalty in readers' polls conducted by music papers such as New Musical Express and Record Mirror, whenever one group displaced the other at the top of the music chart. The news ran under a screeching headline, as if the Beatles and the Stones were football rivals or opposing candidates in a high-stakes election. People also tended to be deeply entrenched in their opinions. Beatles fans were often so devoted to the group that they would hear nothing against the Beatles. Youths who were enthralled to the Stones tended to be equally intransigent they simply would not abide any criticism of their idols. It is sometimes said that the rivalry between the Beatles and the Stones was just a myth, concocted by sensationalizing journalists and Natilda Macron teeny boppers. In reality, we are told, the two groups were always friendly, admiring, and supportive of each other. It is doubtful, however, that their relations were ever so cozy or uncomplicated. The two groups clearly struck up a rapport, but that never stopped them from trying to outperform each other wherever and however they could. And as most people understand, emulous competition rarely nourishes a friendship more often it breeds anxiety, suspicion, and envy. It is little wonder, then, that in some respects the Beatles and the Stones simply could not help but act like rival bands. Ensconced in West London, the Stones fancied themselves as hip cosmopolitans. They were obsessed with a particular style of cool which they associated with reticence and self-possession and so they were bemused by the Beatles' amiable goofball shtick, their corny repartee and their obvious eagerness to please. Furthermore, the Beatles came from the North Country the industrialized and economically depressed region in England that the young stones had always assumed was a culturally barren wasteland. Not only were they wrong about that, but like most Merseysiders, the Beatles were sensitive to even the hint of condescension. That may help to explain why when the two groups were first getting acquainted, the successful Beatles sometimes seemed to lord it over the stones. Before long, However, the Beatles began to feel stifled by their cuddly, mop-top image, and they envied the Stones for their relative freedom of movement. The Beatles may also have been rankled as the Stones gained greater credibility with the right types of fans, discerning bohemians, as opposed to hysterical teeny boppers. Of all the Beatles, John Lennon especially hated to have to stifle his personality the way he often did. Later, 
he would be annoyed by the way that underground newspapers portrayed the Stones as left-wing political heroes, while the Beatles were associated with the hippies' soft idealism. The Beatles and the Stones also represent two sides of one of the 20th century's greatest aesthetic debates. To this day, when people want to get to know each other better, they often ask, Beatles or Stones? A preference for one group over the other is thought to reveal something substantial about one's personality, judgment, or temperament. The cliché tilde copyright s about the two groups are sometimes overdrawn but they still retain a measure of plausibility. With some qualifications, the Beatles may be described as Apollonian, the Stones as Dionysian the Beatles pop, the Stones rock the Beatles erudite, the Stones visceral the Beatles utopian, the Stones realistic. None of the other famous dueling paradigms say, in literature, painting or architecture tend to draw people into conversation like the Beatles and the Stones. How could they? The Beatles and Stones were popular artists of unprecedented magnitude their worldwide record sales are by now uncountable. Obviously the two groups shared a great deal in common so too did their fans. Had he lived long enough, Sigmund Freud that master of unmasking human motivations might have understood the Beatles Stones debate in terms of the narcissism of small differences. It is precisely the minor differences in people who are otherwise alike that form the basis of hostility between them, Freud wrote. Nevertheless, it is the opposing qualities of the Beatles and the Stones which are widely known and well understood that make comparison irresistible. Chances are, if you're reading this book, you already have an informed opinion about which group was better. Moy M.A. tilde superscript army, I don't try to adjudicate the question here. Many others have already done so and anyhow, I'm not a rock critic I'm an historian. In this joint biography, I've merely juxtaposed the Beatles and the Stones, examined their interrelations and shown how their rivalry was constructed. That is not to say that I don't hold a preference for one group over the other, of course I do, but rather that it is outside the purview of this book. Besides, when rational criticism prevails, both groups are lauded. When they were in their prime, the Beatles and the Stones were both irreducibly great. Is that to repeat a dogma? Sure. But that doesn't make what they accomplished any less remarkable. Somehow, the young men who made up the Beatles and the Stones managed not only to find each other, but also to burnish their talents collectively. Both groups melded and alchemized into huge creative forces that were substantially greater than the sum of their collective parts. They came of age during one of the most fertile and exciting periods in the history of popular music, and they exerted a commanding presence. That, anyhow is my own view. And I know I'm not alone. Marianne Faithfull, who dated Mick Jagger in the late sixties, recalled the evening that I mentioned earlier, when members of the Beatles and the Stones turned up at that trendy nightclub and showed off their latest creations for all their friends, Beggar's Banquet, and Hey Jude and Revolution. Vesuvio closed a couple of weeks later, Marianne said, but the feeling in the room that night was, aren't we all the greatest bunch of young geniuses to grace the planet and isn't this the most amazing time to be alive? And I don't think it was just the drugs. Chapter 1 Gentlemen or Thugs If you wanted to measure the distance between what the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were really like, before they became famous, versus the heavily mediated, highly stylized images they projected to their fans, you might seek the perspective of someone who not only knew both groups, but who also knew exactly what they were up to when they went about crafting their public personas. That person would be Shauna Maani, a successful London-based publisher who frequently wrote under the nom de guerre Johnny Dean. In August 1963, Omar Ani began putting out the Beatles monthly book, the group's fan magazine, usually known simply as the Beatles book. By December, he was selling about 330,000 Beatles books each month. Then in June 1964, he launched the similarly minded Rolling Stones book. These were both official fan magazines, and naturally, before Omar and he was awarded the right to publish them, he had to win each group's trust and affection. He met the Beatles for the first time in May 1963, 
when they appeared at London's Playhouse Theatre to record some songs for the influential BBC radio programme Saturday Club. As soon as I shook hands with John, Paul, George, and Ringo, I realized this wasn't going to be one of their jokey encounters with the press, Omar and he recollected. Instead, the group peppered him with questions and suggestions. Editing their magazine meant that they would have to admit someone new to their inner circle, he explained, and put up with me in their dressing rooms, recording studios, homes in fact, virtually everywhere they went. Since Summer and he was already acquainted with the Rolling Stones managers Andrew Lou Goldham and Eric Easton the sussing out process would not have been as formal, but presumably he had to reassure them as well. Though the Beatles and the Rolling Stones regularly appeared in all of the British music periodicals, Melody Maker, Record Mirror, New Musical Express, Disc, Music Echo, as well the nation's teenage pop magazines, Boyfriend, Jackie, Fabulous, Rave, Valentine, Omar and he operated from a special vantage awarded the sole and exclusive rights to publish their profit-oriented fan magazines. He became thickly intertwined in a socio-professional relationship with Epstein, Oldham and Easton, and the groups they managed. Whatever Omar and his private knowledge or feelings, his acquiescence was complete. In 1964, when journalist Michael Braun released his book Love Me Do! Exclamation Mark a gossipy account of his travels with the Beatles during the first flush of Beatlemania, which rather contradicted the group's squeaky clean image its publication was not even mentioned in the Beatles book. Nor was Amar any eager to reveal that John Lennon was married, since Epstein feared that that knowledge would adversely affect the band's popularity with teenage girls. When publishing photos of the Beatles, Omar and he often turned to retouch artists who would fix any splotches or blemishes on their ear faces, thereby making sure they were the sort of pictures Brian wanted fans to see. In other words, Omar and he in this period closely resembled a Madison Avenue flack. Whatever inside information he had, he would never have wanted to print anything truly revelatory about John or Paul, or Mick or Keith or Brian. Instead, his magazines were merely platforms they were meant to promote the Beatles and the Rolling Stones carefully considered brands meticulously. Many years later, though, when he had no need to belie his true feelings, he summed up the two groups this way, the Beatles were thugs who were put across as nice blokes, and the Rolling Stones were gentlemen who were made into thugs by Andrew. Like many summations, this one may be a little too neat, but it's much closer to the truth than either band would like to have admitted during most of the 1960s. I sense a sense a sense. Thuggery is of course a moral category, not a socio-economic one, but much has been made of the fact that, however sunny their dispositions, the Beatles emerged from dreary old Liverpool, a declining industrial seaport that was pummeled by the German Luftwaffe during World War II. Diversely populated, but largely consisting of the descendants of Irish refugees, Liverpool's hub teemed with Rahun seamen and grimy pubs, and was almost completely lacking in refinement. Owing to some measure of pride, obstinacy, and self-deprecation, many Liverpudlians self-identified as Scousers, but elsewhere in England, the term was applied purely with derision. By contrast, the Stones came from the outskirts of London. Though hardly affluent, on the whole they grew up a bit more comfortably than the Beatles, and in Britain's class-riven society, the distinction mattered enormously. We were the ones that were looked down upon as animals by the Southerners, the Londoners, John Lennon remembered. Given the scarcity and hardship that afflicted all of England in the immediate post-war period, to say nothing of the difficulties of drawing class distinctions, it is important to put the differences between the Beatles and the Stones backgrounds in careful perspective. A good treatment of the Beatles' origins can be found in Stephen D. Stark's Meet the Beatles, a cultural history of the band that shook youth, gender, and the world. Yes, Stark points out, the Beatles came from downtrodden Liverpool, but John, Paul, and George all resided in the city's leafy suburban districts. 
On the good side of the Mersey River, only Ringo came from central Liverpool he was born in a ramshackle row house in a notorious neighbourhood called the Dingle, Lennon was the sole Beatle who was fortunate enough to grow up in a home with indoor plumbing, but that is not quite as remarkable as it might seem, since fewer than half of British homes had indoor toilets in that period, and while Paul and George were both raised half a mile apart in state subsidised council houses. Their quarters carried none of the stigma attached to American-style housing projects. Their homes got very cold in the winter, but they still compared favorably to the lodgings of many working-class families at that time. Many years later, George's older sister, Louise, quibbled with the perception that their family was so rough and tumble poor. My father drove a bus, and mom looked after us at home she said. Occasionally she would take a job at about Christmas time. Dot. But we never thought of ourselves as poor or anything. Afterward you read these stories about the Beatles growing up in slums and all this kind of stuff. Dot. But, we had a good, warm, friendly family life. And in one of his final interviews, Lennon stressed that his childhood hardly resembled the poor slummy kind of image that was projected in all the Beatles stories. Naturally, when the Beatles were growing up, they all endured the UK's rationing of food and petrol. Fresh eggs, fresh milk, and juice were hard to come by. All four Beatles would have walked and played amidst bombed out buildings and charred rubble left over from the war. The dazzling array of consumer goods and leisure opportunities that so many American teens enjoyed during the booming 1950s would have been completely foreign to them. But by the standards of their day, only Ringo, who in addition to being poor, was afflicted by two major childhood illnesses suffered real deprivation. Growing up, the Rolling Stones were also familiar with rationing and wartime rubble, but they were better off than the Beatles. Brian Jones, the group's charismatic founder and early leader, came from an upper middle class home in Cheltenham. His father was an aerospace engineer and church leader. Mick Jagger was from Dartford. Kent his well-educated father was an assistant schoolmaster and college phys ed instructor, and his mother was a hairdresser, an occupation that carries a bit more prestige in England than in the States. According to the Stones' official 1965 biography, Jagger was raised in a climate of middle-class a gentility. As his three-bedroom childhood home had a name, Newlands, and when he was young his family vacationed in Spain and Street Trape. Keith Richards likewise came from Dartford. After briefly attending the same primary school as Jagger, his parents migrated to a drab, cheaply built council estate, but they never gave up their middle class aspirations. In response, Richards cultivated what he later described as an inverted snobbery. One was proud to come from the lowest part of town and play the guitar too. He boasted, grammar school people were considered pansies, twerps. Only the Stones' two peripheral members, Bill Wyman and Charlie Watts, were solidly working class. Bill's dad was a bricklayer, and Charlie's drove a truck. But in spite of England's strict class hierarchy, whereby sons typically marched lockstep into the same types of professions as their fathers, both young men could afford to be fairly optimistic about their prospects by the time they joined the Stones. Watts was working as a graphic designer, and Wyman held a department store job while playing bass semi-professionally. Furthermore, the Stones came from southern England, and the Beatles from the north. Differences between the two regions were stark. Writing in 1845, Benjamin Disraeli described Northern and Southern England as two nations between whom there is no intercourse and no sympathy, and a hundred odd years later, the situation had hardly changed. To Londoners, Stephen Stark writes, Liverpool seemed almost like the frontier impertinent, emotional, and a lot less important than the capital city, which was considered the centre of almost everything the establishment considered English. Liverpool actually may have had a more robust music scene than London, but as fledgling musicians with thick Scouse accents, the Beatles knew the odds were stacked against them. With us being from Liverpool, Harrison remembered, people would always say, hey you've got to be from London to make it. They thought we were hicks or something. George was correct, initially. The Beatles were seriously disadvantaged by their origins, 
maybe even more than they realized. Certainly Deco executive Dick Rowe aka the man who turned down the Beatles had Liverpool on his mind after he heard the group's audition tape in early 1962. It's not that he thought the Beatles were bad, but with limited resources, his company had to make a choice. They could sign the Beatles, or they could go with Brian Poole and the Tremlows. Many years later he explained that his unfortunate decision had rested, at least in part, upon the fact that Brian Poole was from London. That meant that his staff could spend night and day with Brian at no cost to the company, whereas Liverpool is a long way away. You've got to get a steam-powered train. You've got a hotel bill to pay. You don't know how long you're going to be up there. And London is so very strange about the north of England. There's sort of an expression that if you live in London, you really don't know anywhere north of Watford. So, you see, Liverpool could have been Greenland to us then. Mick Jagger's old flame Marianne Faithful likewise confessed that geographic prejudice against the Beatles was rampant among her charmed circle of friends. We looked at them as being very provincial, very straight, sort of a little behind the London people, she said. Only later did she conclude that that attitude was very patronizing and not really true. I sent say sent say sense. Of course it would be unfair, and even stupid to draw too much from this to infer that the Beatles were thugs or that the Stones were gentlemen based upon where they came from. More relevant is the knowledge that growing up, three of the four Beatles were known troublemakers, and the charismatic John Lennon was easily the group's most loutish member. On that last point, the historical record is so unequivocal that it is almost unseemly to delve into the details. Going all the way back to primary school. Lennon is remembered as a garden variety delinquent the type of kid who would pocket the change he was instructed to deposit in the church collection box, and pilfer from his aunt's handbag. He would hitch free rides on the bumpers of tram cars, steal cigarettes and then sell them, pull down girls' underpants, vandalize phone booths, set stuff on fire, act the clown in class, skip detention, gamble, pick fights and arouse fear in others as he and his friends tooled around on their bicycles. He was, by his own admission, the kingpin of that age group, and many years later, an erstwhile neighbor could only remark, running into John Lennon and his gang in Walton on their bikes was not an enjoyable social encounter. Lennon continued in this vein when he attended the Liverpool College of Art, where, according to biographer Coleman, his work, erratically presented, was the last thing his teachers, worried about. Instead, they fretted about his incredible capacity for causing trouble. Armed with a course to quit, Lennon could be spectacularly cruel. One classmate remembered, he was the biggest Mickey take I've ever met. He picked on all kinds of characters in school, whatever their backgrounds, and tried to find some way of laughing at them. For some inexplicable reason, anyone who was physically afflicted, whether by disability or injury, was especially likely to be targeted by Lennon. Drinking only seemed to exacerbate his meanness, and a, according to his first wife, Cynthia, he had a very small capacity before he became aggressive. With women, Lennon was a notorious cad. He was obnoxiously possessive of whomever he dated, yet rarely faithful to anyone and disparaging of those who were too timid to go to bed with him. His best childhood friend, Pete Shotton, explained that Lennon came to be regarded, by all but his small circle of friends, as thoroughly bad news. Even I sometimes worried that he seemed destined for Skid Row. Of course, Lennon had many appealing qualities as well. It was not unusual for him to show flashes of the warmth and sensitivity that he would later become well known for, and his friends always reckoned that his obnoxious behavior was merely his way of camouflaging his pain and vulnerability. Though Hunter Davis's authorized biography of the Beatles implies that Lennon may have had a happy childhood, in fact he had a terrible one. His father, Alf, abandoned him when he was very young and later his mother, Julia always a bit of a floozy left him in the custody of his aunt Mimi and uncle George, the latter of whom died unexpectedly in 1955. As a young teenager, Lennon began reconnecting with his mother, but the rapprochement was confusing, to say the least. In 1979, Lennon recorded an audio diary, which surfaced in 2008, 
in which he reminisced about a time he'd laid in bed with his mother when he was fourteen. Somehow, he touched her breast, and then he wondered about trying something more. Then when Lennon was seventeen, Julia was struck and killed by an errant driver. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me, Lennon said. We'd caught up so much, me and Julia, in just a few years. In losing a parent, Lennon had something in common with Paul McCartney, whose mother Mary died from complications of breast cancer surgery when he was just 14. His choir boy looks notwithstanding, Paul likewise sometimes engaged in aberrant teenage behavior, though nothing to rival Lennon's. He would merely play hooky and steal trifling things, like cigarettes, and on one occasion he may have helped steal some valuable audio equipment from a local church. Later, McCartney seemed chagrined about his uninspiring values, all I wanted was women, money, and clothes, he said. According to one biographer, without question one of young Paul's greatest natural attributes was his smooth sense of diplomacy and persuasive charm. Apprehended red-handed perpetrating any number of naughty boyish pranks. Dot. He generally managed to weasel his way out. The youngest Beatle, George Harrison, likewise managed to stay clear of any real trouble when he was growing up, in spite of being incredibly laxly supervised. They let me stay out all night and have a drink when I wanted to, he said of his parents. That's probably why I don't really like alcohol much today. I'd had it all by the age of ten. Still, George embarked on a classic anti-conformist, teenage rebellion trip, stubbornly disobeying his teachers, altering his school uniform slicking his hair back with gobs of pomade, and tramping through Liverpool in blue suede shoes. From about the age of 13, all we were interested in was rock and roll, remembered one of his friends. Of the four Beatles, Ringo is the only one whose childhood reputation seems unblemished by any dubious activities. Whether this speaks to his affable good nature, or his instinct for self-preservation, is hard to know. The hoodlums who prowled around the dingle operated on a whole different order of magnitude than, say, John Lennon's bicycle gang. It was the type of place, Ringo recalled, where you kept your head down, your eyes open, and you didn't get in anybody's way. Ringo also was not with the Beatles during most of their trips to Hamburg, Germany, though he, too, regularly performed there as the drummer for Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Still, Beatles scholars agree that the Hamburg experience was formative. Forced to adhere to a brutally demanding schedule, that is where they honed their individual skills, matured into a tightly knit unit, and were introduced, via the beautiful photographer Astrid Kircher, to the haircuts that evolved into the mop top. Hamburg is also the place where the Beatles consisting of John, Paul, George, drummer Pete Best, and bassist Stu Sutcliffe enjoyed an almost unimaginably debauched lifestyle of drink, women, and pills punctuated occasionally by violence, though Pete refrained from the pills, and Stu shied away from the women except for Astrid. If a few music industry insiders in the early 1960s regarded the Beatles as thugs, their sojourns in Hamburg where they held residences at four different nightclubs over a 28-month period are part of the reason why. Hamburg bears some similarities to Liverpool both are seaports, home to migrant communities, that endured strafing attacks during World War II, and the two cities even share the same line of latitude, 56 degrees north. But the street Pauli district, where the Beatles played made Liverpool's roughest neighbourhood, Scotty Road, seem almost tranquil. Street Pauly may even have been the most stereotypically sinful place in the world. All of the clubs the Beatles played the Star Club, the K. Isaac Keller, the Top Ten, and the Indra were on or around the Reaper Bane, the street known to Germans as Dysar One Quart and Ijme Isle, the Sinful Mile. It teemed with strippers, prostitutes, petty criminals, and the worst types of itinerants who intermingled in brothels, sex clubs, and dark and grotty bars controlled by mobsters. The Beatles, meanwhile, ranged in age from 17 to 20 when they initially visited Hamburg, 
and for the first time in their lives, they had a wee bit of money in their pockets. It was a recipe for mayhem. As performers, the Beatles were famously encouraged to match or put on a lively show, and when they were jacked up on amphetamines and saturated with beer as was often the case they had little trouble generating excitement. Though merely a bar band at this point, specializing in American rock and roll numbers from the likes of Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, and Carl Perkins, they played faster and harder than most of their peers, and their inspired performances quickly helped them to earn an intense following. With his open-legged stance before the microphone, Lennon was an especially physical presence, and he is said by biographer Philip Norman to have sometimes gone berserk in Hamburg's clubs, prancing and groveling in imitation of any rock and roller or movie monster his dazzled mind could summon up. The fact that their audience could not understand a word they said provoked John into cries of a say Kyle, and a fucking Nazis, to which the audience invariably responded by laughing and clapping. Other times, Lennon would pass out drunk behind a piano leaving the others to play without him. A 1962 bootleg recording documents a performance at the Star Club where Lennon sung the lyrics to Shimmy Shaker's Shitty Shitty, and Paul introduced Bissay Macho as a special request for Hitler. The entire bandette, drank, and smoked on stage, and occasionally they found themselves throwing furniture around while staging mock fights. Once, Lennon played in his underwear, with a toilet seat around his neck. Locals sometimes referred to them as the Vera One Quartiched Beatles, the Crazy Beatles. And of course, the Beatles outfitted themselves in leather gear from head to toe. Sex in Hamburg was easily obtained for the handsome Beatles far more so than in England and their attitude toward it was unembarrassed. Pete Best claims that the band regularly took to partner swapping, and that each member averaged two or three girls each night depending on their stamina. Even if he's exaggerating, as seems likely, his bandmates have confirmed that they regularly brought women back to their cramped quarters for late night romps. It was a sex shock, McCartney explained. We got a very swift baptism of fire into the sex scene. There was a lot of it about and we were off the leash. Lennon put the matter a bit more forthrightly, between the whores and the groupies our dicks all just about dropped off. Amid all of these chaotic indulgences, dangerous undercurrents of violence pulsed through Hamburg. Many of the waiters and barmen in the clubs the Beatles played doubled as professional criminals the whole lot of them carried switchblades, truncheons, and lead-weighted saps. Sometimes, as the Beatles were packing up their gear at the end of a long night, patrons who'd run afoul of the waiters would still be lying half dead on the floor. In other instances, bar fights became so riotous they could only be quashed with tear gas, which of course sent everyone, Beatles included, pouring out of the club, crying and wheezing. Virtually every night at the Indress and poor bastard was either bottled, knifed, or worse, Lennon recalled. Usually the Beatles merely witnessed the horrific violence, but on a few occasions they acted like common roughnecks. Some of their worst behavior may have been accentuated by the fact that they grew accustomed to gobbling slimming pills called prelis, preludin. Now off the market, these little blue pills could loosen a person's inhibitions, keep him awake, and put him seriously on edge. In one legendary incident, Paul and Stu Shaggy marked, made a show when they fell into fisticuffs during the middle of a set. Another time, while playing cards in their flat above the Star Club, John drunkenly struck someone upside the head with a beer bottle. Within seconds the fellow, Lennon struck, had gotten up and knocked the hell out of John, pasting him all over the flat, remembers a friend. And all of us stood there and let him do it because we agreed that you don't go round hitting people on the head with bottles and expect to get away with it. A long circulating rumor holds that when he was especially sozzled, Lennon would sometimes find a perch from which to urinate on the heads of nuns who passed by on the streets below. In another despicable episode from his Hamburg career, Lennon once proposed that the Beatles should mug a drunken sailor they just met. Paul and George proved too timid to execute the plan, so John and Pete were left to attack the tipsy mariner on a dark corner, at which point they got more than they bargained for. 
their victim retaliated with a fierce volley of punches and then whipped out what the two Beatles thought was a pistol. In fact, the sailor's gun only shot tear gas pellets, but it was enough to send two assailants scrambling for their lives. Whenever the Beatles returned to Liverpool clubs and dance halls, they brought a little bit of Hamburg with them. They liked us because we were kind of rough, and we'd had a lot of practice in Germany, said Harrison. There were all these acts going ed armed them and suddenly we'd come on, jumping and stomping. Wild men in leather suits. An early fan described them as raw. Dot. They were always in their leather jackets, Cuban heels, and their hair everywhere. It was so different from the run of the mill groups at the time with their suede collared jackets and matching colors all blues and yellows. Liverpool disc jockey Bob Wooler remembered Lennon commanded the stage. Dot. The way he stared. Dot. And stood. His legs would be wide apart, that was one of his trademarks. And of course it was regarded as being very sexual. The girls up front would be kind of looking up his legs, keeping a watch on the crotch, as it were. It was a very aggressive stance that he adopted. The group continued taking prelies and purple hearts, supplied by Paul's girlfriend, who stole them from a pharmacy she worked at, and when the band played lunchtime engagements, Lennon would banter sarcastically with the audience especially with those who worked in nearby offices. I saw Sharap, you with the suits on, became a regular Lennon message. One biographer said, he mocked them for taking a regular jobs. As and since the enthusiasm that the Beatles stimulated in teenage women sometimes elicited an inverse response from Merseyside's tough young men, the Beatles still got into the occasional brawl. According to Best, George was too puny for real fighting, and sometimes called for rescue, but John. Dot was always ready to have a go. After Stuart Sutcliffe died from a brain hemorrhage in 1961, an autopsy found an indentation in his skull, and some have speculated that the trauma might have occurred when a group of Liverpool teddy boys attacked him earlier that year, when Brian Epstein saw the Beatles for the first time, at Liverpool's Cavern Club in late 1961, they were much improved since their first Hamburg engagement almost two years prior. For all their louch behavior, the Beatles still maintained a brutally demanding schedule in Germany. In one year and a half stretch alone, they are thought to have played 270 shows, clocking in more than 800 performance hours. Epstein saw the Beatles as a four-piece band, Sutcliffe having recently left, to be replaced by McCartney on bass and soon Ringo would take Pete Best's perch behind the drums. But the group was very different back then from the one that most people recognize today as the Beatles. Before they were catapulted to fame, they lived very roughly, sleeping around, popping pills, drinking a lot, and occasionally getting into fights. When they weren't attired in matching leathers, they dressed slovenly. Their reputation was not based upon any recorded work but rather on their kinetic live performances, led by a charismatic frontman who was known to greet even fans with practiced arrogance, they projected a thoroughly disreputable, slightly dangerous aura. British music journalist Chris Hutchins described them this way, the Beatles when they lived in Hamburg were what the Stones became. I sent say sent say sense. In his capacity for making mischief and harming others, Brian Jones, the Rolling Stones founder and guitarist, was no slouch. His background, however, was altogether different from Lennon's. Both of Jones's parents were university educated, and Jones was himself a talented student at age 15. He got nine O-level passes in the General Certificate of Education, the British National Subject Exam, and entered the sixth form the optional and selective last two years of school in England, he was a rebel. Dot. But when examinations came, he was brilliant, remembered one childhood friend. Brian's mother, Louisa, wistfully recalled that young Brian sometimes talked of becoming a dentist, and we were all behind him especially when he did so well at school. Jones also showed youthful athletic promise and growing up in Cheltenham a ritzy but dull spa town that Keith Richards once described as an old lady's resting place he learned how to comport himself in a respectable manner. He had a stable home life, 
and very early on his parents recognized and encouraged his prodigious musical talent, according to Brian's beleaguered father, Lewis. The onset of his son's problems with authorities struck abruptly, and forcefully, when he was about 17 or 18 not long after he'd taken up the alto sax and become consumed with improvisational jazz, especially as practiced by Charlie Parker. He started to rebel against everything mainly me, said Lewis. When Brian was confronted about his disorderly behavior at school, which led to at least two suspensions, his father lamented that Brian was terribly logical about it all. You want me to do the things you did, Brian explained. But I can't be like you. I have to live my own life a life that in short order would mean leaving his studies behind, drifting about, flirting with poverty, and evading adult responsibilities. In 1959, when Jones was 17, he was expelled from Cheltenham Grammar School after his 14-year-old girlfriend became pregnant and declined to have the abortion that Brian had assiduously lobbied for. This was the first of at least several, some have claimed five, illegitimate children. The following year, a one-night stand led to another woman's pregnancy. Then in 1961, after making his way through several low-wage vocations, shop assistant, deliverer of coal, bus conductor, Apprentice at the local housing office, Brian made a young woman named Pat Andrews pregnant. She likewise carried the baby, apparently with the understanding that, given the mores of the time, as well as Brian's personal reassurances, he would soon marry her. He did not. Instead, he beat his way to London to work in an optician's office, forcing Ms. Andrews to track him down, baby and belongings in tow and demand that he take them in. It would be difficult to describe the shame this must have brought upon Brian's family. After the optician job, Jones worked at a department store from which he was fired for theft. Later he would leave the employ of a record store, and then a newsstand, after committing the same offense at both places. Brian was totally dishonest, remembered Ian Stewart, the Stones regular keyboardist. When the opportunity arose, he could also be a world-class bully. Keith Richards recalled how Brian used to torment their insecure, sycophantic roommate Dick Hattrell, within two weeks Brian took him for every penny, and he conned Dick into buying him this whole new Harmony electric guitar, having his amp fixed and getting him a whole new set of harmonicas. Dick would do anything Brian said. It was freezing and the worst winter. Brian would say, give me your overcoat and he gave Brian his army overcoat, give Keith the sweater, so I put the sweater on, now you walk twenty yards behind us, and we'd walk off to the local wimpy bar, stay there, you can't come in, give us a pound too, Dick would stand outside this hamburger joint, freezing, Brian would invite Dick to lunch and the three of us would go to what we considered a really good restaurant, and have a hot meal, which nobody could afford, of course. Then we just walk out and leave Dick with the bill. One winter evening, Brian even locked Hatterall out of the house, forcing him to pound on the front door for hours, begging to be let back in, by which time he'd turned blue. Worst of all, according to bandmate Bill Wyman, one night Brian punched, bait Andrews, in the face and she ran home with a black eye, crying. A few hours later, Brian, the true romantic, arrived outside her home, throwing pebbles up at her window and shouting his apologies. They were quickly reunited. Philip Norman, the Stone's best biographer, observed that when Brian fixed anyone with his big baby eyes and spoke in his soft, lisping, well brought up voice, it was impossible to imagine the chaos accumulating behind him. Someone else called him a Botticelli angel with a cruel streak. His genteel background and, at times, shy and quiet persona masked an incredible capacity for harming others. In its own way, Jones's softness must have been just as disarming as Lennon's impish humor and quick wit. Though rarely as outwardly aggressive as Lennon, he clearly shared some of Lennon's capacity for antisocial be have you. But when we examine the backgrounds of the other future Rolling Stones, we find very little to suggest that they were destined to become the archetypal bad boys of rock and roll. As a teenager, Michael Jagger was accustomed to middle-class creature comforts, and he even had the means to become a regular mail-order customer of chess records, 
the famous Chicago blues label, I never got to have a raving adolescence between the age of 12 and 15, Jagger explained, because I was concentrating on my studies. Dot. But then that's what I wanted to do, and I enjoyed it. About the notorious Teddy Boy subculture, which anyhow was on the wane by the time he was old enough to participate, Jagger said he wasn't particularly impressed. It is true that at around age 15, he began fashioning an insubordinate sort of attitude his academic performance slipped as he became interested in girls and rhythm and blues, and his love of sports gave way to less salubrious habits, like beer and cigarettes but never was he at any risk of failing out of Dartford Grammar School, the rough equivalent of a selective American high school. In fact, he passed seven O-levels, entered the sixth form, and was admitted into the prestigious London School of Economics where he blended in perfectly and began laying plans for an elite career in politics or business. About Keith Richards, one must resist the temptation to make too much of the fact that he was, literally, a choir boy. In 1953, at age nine, he even had the honor of singing in Westminster Abbey at Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. When he was twelve, though, he was sent to the lowly regarded Dartford Tech, and in 1959, School officials expelled him for truancy. By this point, Keith was styling himself in dark glasses, pink socks, and black drain pipe trousers, and carrying his guitar everywhere, slung over his back. Rock and roll got me into being one of the boys, he recalled. Before that I just got me ass kicked all over the place. Learned how to ride a punch. His next stop was Sidka Park College, a tax subsidized training school of last resort for people like Richards, who, it was hoped, might be able to acquire some kind of marketable skill in the realm of commercial art. Instead, Richards found himself surrounded by many other alienated and vaguely bohemian musicians. It was at Sidcup that Richards made his first forays into recreational drugs, amphetamines, and painkillers, but according to a biographer, he was not then regarded as a degenerate or a major troublemaker, but rather as a free-spirited dot. Pest, blessed with a quick wit. Nor did Charlie Watts or Bill Wyman arouse any great fury as young adults. In fact, Watts was considered the most stylish young man at his advertising agency, wearing charcoal-colored trousers and good quality sweaters when he did not wear a suit. According to a friend, Charlie's concession to joining the Stones was taking his tie off at gigs. Furthermore, around the time he hooked up with the Stones, his premier interest was not in rock or blues, but jazz. Bill Wyman also did not share the same musical interests as Jones, Jagger, and Richards when he joined the Stones instead of R.B., he'd been playing white rock and roll in the Cliftons but as he wrote in his memoir, the major difference between the Stones and me when we met mattered even more than the music. I was a young family man with a wife, a nine-month-old child and a day job. Wyman was also about six years older, on average, than the rest of the Stones. It is true, though, that early in the Rolling Stones saga, when Brian, Mick, and Keith all lived together, they seemed to deliberately slum up their Edith Grove flat in an attempt to fashion bohemian lifestyles. The place was an absolute pit which I shall never forget, wrote Wyman. I've never seen a kitchen like it permanently piled high with dirty dishes and filth everywhere. They took a strange delight in pointing out the various cultures that grew in about 40 smelly milk bottles laying around in mold and on congealed eggs. They lobbed disgusting gobs of spit onto their own walls and let rubbish accumulate everywhere. What little heat they had emanated from an electric coin meter, but sometimes it was so cold they stayed in bed all day. A single, bare light bulb hung from the ceiling, and even food was scarce. I never understood why they carried on like this, Wyman later said. Although Keith came from a working class background, Brian and Mick were from well-to-do families. It could not have been just the lack of money that caused them to sink. Instead, he concluded there was a voguish quality to their behavior they must have been afflicted with some kind of bohemian angst. The image the Stones later embraced, then, was not entirely a surprise. People remember that although Mick Jagger was always interested in achieving financial success, he was also a skilled poser. Even before he joined the Stones, he traded in his given name, Michael, 
for the more laddish sounding Mick, and he was known to switch easily between his proper London accent and a folk cockney tongue that might have fooled someone into thinking he was from the East End. But beyond this, and with the partial exceptions of Brian Jones, whose sociopathic tendencies were not immediately discernible, and Keith Richards, whose unruly demeanor really wasn't all that unruly, we don't find anything in the backgrounds of the future Rolling Stones to suggest that they would one day arouse such tremendous fear and indignation. No one would have expected them to become anti-establishment icons objects of tabloid fury and rough justice from the courts. In fact, the very idea that stones would soon become synonymous with debauchery and rock and roll excess first across the British Isle, and then the world would have seemed preposterous to the band in its earliest incarnation. When the Rollin' Stones began performing together in July 1962, consisting of Brian, Mick, Keith, Dick Taylor on bass, Ian Stewart on piano, and Tony Chapman on drums, they didn't fancy themselves as rock and rollers, but rather, as RB purists. They specialized in covers of black American artists like Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, and Bo Diddley, which they performed while sitting down. Someone who caught the stones early on described them this way, they seemed accomplished and rather like art school nice guys, no posturing they were almost like jazzers. Dot. They were gauche, Nigel de Macron, friendly, and generally without any charisma, they were just doing their music. Bill Wyman said something similar when he got in league with the Stones in December 1962. He of course recognized Brian's and Mick's naturally projected sex appeal, but on stage they were keen on projecting the music. Selling themselves as sexy pop stars had not crossed their minds. RB was a minority thing that had to be defended at all times, Jagger recollected. There was a kind of crusade mentality. By contrast, Rock and roll seemed weak artistically compromised and commercially corrupted. A substantial portion of the Stones' audience consisted of bohemians and intellectuals, many of whom were men, and it wasn't difficult to perceive a measure of snobbery in the Stones' attitude, which seemed calculated to draw a distance between themselves, and what Jagger called waffly white pop. But I mean there's always going to be good looking guys with great haircuts he added, that's what pop music is about, I sense a sense a sense, Brian Epstein was 27 when he discovered the Beatles, and until then, he'd never expressed any interest in pop management, in fact, when he was 16, he carefully crafted a letter to his parents in which he surveyed various careers that he decided he was not interested in business, law, the ministry before announcing that he'd finally realized what he wanted to do he would make his fortune designing dresses. Given his extraordinary interest in fashion, it might not have been a bad path, but Brian's father the well-to-do son of a penniless immigrant, known for his serious mean and tenacious work ethic was horrified at the notion. He'd have preferred, first, that Brian stay in school, but his unhappy son had been such a chronic underachiever that he resolved instead to steer him into the family business, retail furniture. Surprisingly, Brian quickly began showing acumen as a salesman he spent hours arranging the furniture displays in the windows, and he always showed up for work immaculately dressed. As a young man, his biographer posits, he may even have been Liverpool's best dressed bachelor, his thick hair was styled at the Horn Brothers salon, his clothes came from the top tailors, and he found himself popular among girls even though he was secretly gay, homosexuality being illegal in England until 1967. As hobbies, Epstein took up foreign languages, Spanish and French, and he immersed himself in Liverpool's theatre community. In the late 1950s, Brian's dad launched NEMS, North End Music Stores, and hired his son to run the record department. Brian was a demanding, fastidious boss and his regal bearing could rub some people the wrong way. He insisted that his employees should always look their very best, 
and that they address every potential customer as sir or madam even the four particularly disheveled lads in jeans and leather jackets who were always dropping by in the middle of the afternoon to listen to records but rarely to purchase any. They used to drive us crackers, an employee said about the group she later discovered was the Beatles. Often they were looking for way out American music that was not in stock. Epstein had a policy of ordering any record that a customer asked for and in late 1961, he was briefly stumped when requests started trickling in for a new single called My Bonnie, supposedly by the Beatles. Brian searched hard for the record, but it simply didn't seem to exist in any of his ordering catalogs. Finally, he was able to determine that the disc people were seeking, which was recorded in Germany, was actually put out by the English singer-guitarist Tony Sheridan who had merely used the Beatles as a backup band. What's more, the Beatles weren't properly mentioned on the record instead, they were listed as the Beat Brothers, because the company that produced the single thought Beatles sounded too much like Peedles, German slang for penis. Nevertheless, Epstein ordered 25 copies of My Bonnie, which sold out in a day. Then he ordered 50 more discs, and very quickly they, too, disappeared from his record bins. Epstein usually claimed that this was the fated episode that brought the Beatles to his attention and piqued his curiosity so much that he decided to attend one of their lunchtime engagements at the Cavern Club, which happened to be only about a three-minute walk from his store. This could be so, but it's hard to believe. Since July 1961, the Beatles were regularly featured in Bill Harry's Mersey Beat, a music newspaper that Epstein not only distributed at NEMS, but that also featured his own record reviews. Even though Brian's personal tastes were more for Mozart and Shakespeare than rock and roll, it seems likely that the enterprising record store manager would have at least recognized the name of one of Liverpool's most popular bands especially since they played regularly just around the corner. In any event, it was on November 9, 1961, that Brian and his trusty personal assistant Alistair Taylor ventured down the stairs into the cavern where they saw the Beatles for the first time. Inside the club it was as black as a deep grave, dank and damp and smelly and I regretted my decision to come, Epstein later wrote in his memoir, a cellar full of noise. The Beatles, though, impressed him incredibly favorably. He was fascinated by their pounding bass beat and vast engulfing sound, and he could not help but notice the charged enthusiasm of their audience which numbered about 200. He was also struck by the group's rough exterior and devil-may-care attitude. They were not very tidy and not very clean, he remembered. They smoked as they played and ate and talked and pretended to hit each other. They turned their backs on the audience and shouted at them and laughed at private jokes. Some have speculated that it might have been exactly this behavior the Beatles' scrappiness that Epstein found most attractive. Though Epstein was as dapper and debonair as they came, sexually he went for rough trade tough, unpolished, working class greaser types. But Taylor sharply disputes the notion. This accusation has been put up so many times, he complained. It's bullshit. He signed the Beatles because they impressed us. As for the Beatles, it's clear why they went with Epstein. First, as John Lennon put it, he looked efficient and rich. Second, Epstein was the type to think big, and big is how the Beatles were beginning to think as well. Though devoid of pop management experience, Epstein worked evangelically on the Beatles' behalf, championing them to music industry insiders with measures of loyalty, pride, passion, and grit that were exceptional by any standard. Numerous sources suggest that the old story about Brian meeting an audience of nonplussed record executives and angrily blurting out, the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis Presley, is probably true. He really did go about saying that. But before that could happen, Brian always maintained that his boys would have to clean up their act. Except for on one slightly infamous occasion, when he was probably very drunk, Epstein would not dare try to interfere with the Beatles' music, but as their manager, he worked closely with them on their presentation. As a result, he was finally able to exercise some of his long-standing creative and theatrical impulses. Brian wanted to be a star himself, 
producer George Martin speculated that was the essential part of Brian. He couldn't do it as an actor, and now he was able to do it as a man who was a manipulator, a puppeteer, if you like. He loved this role of being the power behind the scenes. The Beatles went along with Brian's desire to tidy up their performance, not because they ever wanted to get into spiffy suits but because they gradually became convinced that he was right. It was a choice of making it or still eating chicken on stage, Lennon remarked. Still, their metamorphosis did not happen overnight, first went the leather jackets, and then the jeans were replaced with smart looking trousers. After that, dot. I got them to wear sweaters on stage, Brain recalled, and only afterward, very reluctantly, did they begin wearing their trademark grey colorless suits which were inspired by Pierre Cardin. Eventually the Beatles' main tailor, Doogie Millings, would make about 500 garments for the group. Meanwhile, Epstein had his secretary type up memos spelling out exactly what the Beatles must not do, they must stop swearing on stage, they must stop joking with the girls, they must stop smoking or carrying cans of coke on stage and so forth. Even some of their off-stage behavior was regulated. For instance, it was fine if they smoked, but only filtered cigarettes. Harsh, unfiltered woodbines, or ollies, were considered DA tilde copyright class A tilde copyright and strictly prohibited. The Beatles were instructed to trim their guitar strings and to bow deeply from the waist after each number. He was a director. That's really what he was, Paul said about Brian. Eventually, Lennon came to despise the Beatles' anodyne image, but it's not clear when that began to happen. Derek Taylor, the Beatles' press officer, dismissed Lennon's posthumous, wise after the event objections to the Beatles' makeover. They didn't mind at the time, he said. They were making more money that way. When the Beatles were filmed for the very first time on August 22, 1962, at the Cavern Club, for a Granada TV program called Know the North. Harrison recalled, it was really hot and we were asked to dress up properly. We had shirts, and ties, and little black pullovers. So we looked quite smart. Dot. And John was into it. But Lennon remembered feeling differently, there we were in suits and everything. It just wasn't us. Even though they played old standbys, like some other guy and Kansas City. Hey 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 hey. Lennon said that was where we started to sell out. Cynthia adds that when Epstein began sprucing up the Beatles, John was always differently minded than the others. Paul was keen on the changes and George was happy to accept them, she recalled. But it wasn't easy for John. When Brian asked them to wear suits and ties, John growled for days. That was what the shadows the group John most despised did. Still, knowing Lennon's ambition, one gets the impression he would have had the group dress up in clown suits if he thought it was necessary. Later on, though, when the Stones showed it was possible to become very successful while acting like hooligans, Lennon became a little annoyed. He always believed the Stones had hijacked the Beatles' a original image, said Chris Hutchins, who was friendly with both bands. Without the Beatles, Lennon reasoned, the Stones never could have gotten away with so much. Brian Epstein made them behave, conform, perform, wear suits, be polite, and, made them do royal variety shows, Hutchins noted. That really left the field open for Andrew to say a hey, fuck that, the Stones don't do that. As Lennon so correctly observed, Brian left the way open for the Stones to occupy a very large vacancy. I sent say sent say sense. It may say something about Andrew Lou Goldham's ego, as well as the richness of his life, that in the first of his three memoirs, nearly 200 pages breeze by before he describes his first exposure to the Rolling Stones, which happened at the Crawdaddy Club in Richmond, Surrey, on a Sunday night in April 1963. Nevertheless, he narrates the occasion in nearly mystical terms it was not only pivotal, but Epiphanus. I'd never seen anything like it, he said. All my preparations, ambitions and desires had just met their purpose. Dot. Everything I'd done up until now was a preparation for this moment. I saw and heard what my life, thus far, had been for. At the time, he was 19 years old and still living with his mother. Whatever he lacked in resources, 
though, he compensated for with style, ambition, and an almost otherworldly amount of chutzpah. His love for the glamorous life was apparent by the time he was a young teen. Oldham was so enchanted by showbiz and celebrity culture that just about every month or so, a friend said, a new public personality would take pride of place in his young heart. A favorite Hollywood icon was Lawrence Harvey, the Lithuanian-born actor who found international stardom in Room at the Top, in which he played an inveterate social climber, and Expresso Bongo, where he played a sleazy talent scout. Another favorite was Tony Curtis, who portrayed the gangsterish press agent Sidney Falco in The Sweet Smell of Success. None of these protagonists brought Mew C.H. Good into the world, but Oldham wasn't interested in these films for their social messages. Instead, they fueled his ambition to become, as he put it, a nasty little upstart tycoon shit. Though of a very different temperament than Epstein, Oldham was also theatrically handsome, and he shared Brian's love of fashion and haute couture. He was the most concerned about clothes person I've ever met in my life to this day, claimed an old business partner. He was meticulous. At age 16, after getting only three O-level passes, he strolled into Bazaar the Famous, youth-oriented boutique operated by Mary Quant and Sweet talked his way into a job as an errand boy for a pound seven per week. His main responsibilities involved preparing tea, taking messages, and walking dogs, but sometimes he helped Quant dress the storefront windows, and she recalled he had all the confidence in the world. For Oldham, the experience was invaluable. I will always thank Mary, and her business partners, for teaching me about fame fashion, money, and how to have fun getting it done, he said. Every evening after work, Andrew would venture over to Soho, where he held a second job waiting tables at a Ronnie Scott's jazz club. Though not musically gifted, he briefly tried to find an agent or a manager who thought he might be able to make it as a pop star. That didn't go anywhere, though Oldham was able to conjure some bright hued aliases for himself. He wanted to be known as either Chancery Lane or Sandy Beach. During this period, Oldham usually managed to constrain his dark side, but not always. His ex-wife Shelia Klein recalls the time when he'd enthusiastically arranged for her to visit a modeling agency. He helped her get styled by Vidal Sassoon, and had her professionally photographed. But then, on the morning of her appointment, his thinking made an abrupt U-turn. He didn't want me to be a model anymore. Sheila remembered. There was no discussion he just locked me in the cupboard and wouldn't let me out. That was the end of my modeling career. Andrew definitely was different. His way of handling a situation was very effective. After a brief sojourn to the south of France, Oldham returned to London and found work in public relations. As a result he was able to meet Phil Spector, the legendary pop producer who, even then, struck a foreboding presence. Spectre made an overwhelming impression on young Andrew. The two of them were a nightmare together, a friend recalled. Andrew got hooked on Phil's not behaving very well. Riding together in darkly tinted limos and dining under the protection of bodyguards, Andrew plied Spectre for advice about how to make it in the music industry. Another very important person Oldham met was Brian Epstein. They crossed paths in January 1963 at the taping of the Beatles' second national television appearance, on ABC TV's hugely popular Thank Your Lucky Stars. Brian merely stood watching his boys, yet his belief and their talent permeated the room, Oldham recalled. In a conversation, Oldham persuaded Epstein to hire him as a London-based PR man for a monthly retainer of £8.25. Mostly, Oldham worked for two of Epstein's recently acquired acts, Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, but sometimes he helped drum up publicity for the Beatles in music weeklies, teen magazines, and daily papers. On one glorious occasion, he even got to chaperone the Beatles to some radio shows and press interviews. Another time, he saw the Beatles play the Granada Theatre in Bedford, just as they were beginning their glide path to superstardom. On stage, you could not hear the Beatles for the roar of the crowd, Oldham rhapsodized. The noise that night hit me emotionally, like a blow to the chest. When I looked at Brian, 
he had the same lump in his throat and tear in his eye as I. Andrew craved these sorts of heady experiences, but it was a routine lunch that changed his life. Peter Jones, of the pop periodical Record Mirror, mentioned that one of his colleagues had just written enthusiastically about the burgeoning RB scene and favorably mentioned a new band, the Rolling Stones, even though they hadn't yet made a record. It looks like rhythm and blues will make it big soon, so why not have a look at them, Jones said. Oldham wasn't particularly enthused by the suggestion, but since he wanted to curry favor with Jones, he figured he should at least appear to be interested in his advice. The next Sunday, Oldham traveled to Richmond, where, he said, I met the Rolling Stones and said a hello to the rest of my life. Oldham not only lacked managerial experience he didn't even have a registered address, and it would be almost two years before he would be old enough to apply for an agent's license. The first person he phoned for help was Epstein, offering him 50% of the Rolling Stones management contract in return for some office space and enough upfront funding to finance a recording session. Citing his obligations to the Beatles and other Liverpool acts, Brian declined. Next, Andrew approached Eric Easton, an older, experienced, London agent who, after some hesitation, expressed interest in accepting a similar deal. Dot. If it could be arranged, Sean and he figured the older Meeston partnership was an excellent one. Andrew was the young go-getter with loads of good ideas for promoting groups and giving them an image, he said. Eric was this rather conservative show business agent, a very straightforward business person, who had the necessary practical knowledge, knew how contracts worked knew how to do bookings, knew that side inside out. The following Sunday, Philip Norman writes, Oldham made the most brilliant self-selling job the 19-year-old had yet pulled off, expertly mixing audacity with intuition. He came on to Brian, Mick, Keith, Stu, Bill, and Charlie as a London big shot who could give them anything they wanted and get anywhere they cared to go. At the same time, he was one of them, a rebel, an outsider who shared their quasi-Marxist ideals and evangelical zeal for bringing pure blues and RB to a wider audience. The bit about Andrew being an RB fan was a particularly hideous distortion in fact, he was glomming onto a trend he'd only just learned about. No doubt Oldham also stressed his connection to the Beatles. He probably said, Hey I am the Beatles publicist how about that as a line? Jagger mused. Everything to do with the Beatles was sort of gold and glittery, and Andrew seemed to know what he was doing. Nevertheless, Keith Richards maintains that Oldham was looking for an alternative to the Beatles from the very outset. Despite being from provincial Liverpool, the Beatles had already scored two big hits with Love Me Do and Please Please Me. Never before had an act from so far north succeeded at that level. I guess Andrew's mind would work this way, Keith reasoned. If Liverpool can produce the Beatles, what can London produce? Liverpool was much further away from London than it is now. There were no streets no highways, I mean, Liverpool is dot. As far as London is concerned, it's Nome, Alaska. But in order to share in the type of success the Beatles were having, Oldham insisted that the Stones make some image and personnel adjustments. On the theory that six members was at least one too many for a successful group, Oldham made them kick out pianist Ian Stewart who anyhow had too square a jaw for Andrew's liking. Keith Richards was bizarrely instructed to drop the S from his last name Keith Richard, Andrew said, looked more pop. Meanwhile, he added a G to the band's name, making them the Rolling Stones otherwise, he said, no one would take them seriously. 26-year-old Bill Wyman was told to begin pretending he was 21. But most significantly, Oldham persuaded the band to loosen up its performance. Though Jones still postured himself as the group's leader, Andrew recognized Jagger's electric appeal and insisted that he share in the limelight. The idea to style the Stones as the anti-Beatles, though to toughen up their image and encourage them to act as surly and defiant as they dared came a bit later, and in fact that was the opposite of what Oldham originally had in mind. Instead, one of his first moves was to buy them a set of matching outfits. Wyman remembers a day when Oldham marched us up to Carnaby Street to put us in suits, tabbed down shirts and knitted ties. On other occasions, the band could be seen in tight black jeans, 
black turtlenecks, and beetle bots. When the Stones debuted on national television, on Thank Your Lucky Stars, they were conscripted into hound's tooth jackets, high button shirts, and slim ties, looking every bit as dainty and amiable as the pop bands they despised. Wyman later remarked that in hindsight, it was obvious that Andrew was attempting to make us look like the Beatles. From his association with them, he was well aware of the power of marketing, and he was initially slotting us as their natural successors rather than as counterparts. The following month, though, when the Stones embarked on their first national tour, sharing a spectacular bill with Bo Diddley, Little Richard, and the Everly Brothers, they began wearing their outfits in a more slovenly style. One night, Charlie Watts unexpectedly doffed his waistcoat in a Fenland dressing room eventually Keith's jacket grew so bespotted with chocolate pudding and whiskey stains that it was no longer wearable. On stage, the whole group loosened up and Jagger took to chewing gum as he sang. Off stage, a journalist observed, they appeared in a jumbled assortment of jeans, silk cardigans, camel jackets and sloppy sweaters. None of the slick suits sported by Bill J. Kramer or Jerry in the pacemakers. When the Stones appeared on a BBC program in October 1963, they frustrated their interviewer by greeting many of his questions with simple yes and no's, rather than hurt their popularity, however, all of this seemed to boost their appeal. Their audiences were becoming more demonstrative and more orcas to the point where the Stones, just as soon as they finished their sets, were forced to flee their venues through the back door and quickly speed off to avoid getting mobbed. Without ever devising or articulating a formula for instigating a cultural revolt, the Rolling Stones began to stumble upon one. Put another way, though widely held, the idea that Andrew Oldham conjured up a belligerent attitude for the Stones, Abovo, is a myth. First, he tried to smarten them up, but Oldham was quick very quick to see the potential in this new approach. By the time the Beatles conquered America on the Ed Sullivan Show, on February 9, 1964, Oldham was actively promoting the Stones as the band your parents loved to hate. The Beatles were accepted and acceptable, he added, they were the benchmark and had set the level of competition. By contrast, the Stones came to be portrayed as dangerous, dirty and degenerate, and I encouraged my charges to be as nasty as they wished to be. He made sure we were as vile as possible. Mick acknowledged. Andrew pitched it so we were very much the antithesis of the Beatles. Of course, the Stones proved masterful at projecting arrogant, sour attitudes. Surely, Jagger was deploying his best cockney put on when he told an interviewer, circa 1964, if people don't like us, well that's too bad. We're not thinking of changing, thanks very much. We've been the way we're at for much too long to think of kowtowing to fanciful folk who think we should start tarting ourselves up with mohair suits and short haircuts. But Jagger was lying. It had only been a short while earlier that the Stones, eager for exposure, appeared on Thank Your Lucky Stars with acceptable hair and matching suits. If the Beatles had sold out by changing their image in order to improve their chances of becoming successful, so too did the Stones only they went through two early transformations. First, they costumed themselves in matching suits and ties, just like any Liverpool pop group. Then within a few months, they began experimenting with a different approach of their own design dressing sloppily, accentuating their sexuality, and behaving obnoxiously. That was an image that suited them perfectly. Though not quite gentlemen in the first place, they became rather convincing as thugs. I sent say sent say sense. Even if they initially set out merely to become the best band in Liverpool, with their life options already severely circumscribed by the time they formed in 1960, the Beatles were quick to embrace one of Rock's core myths, the idea that it promises an escape from the ordinary, workaday world into a parallel universe of wealth, prestige, and excitement. Lennon once revealed that as a child, his most vivid dreams involved either flying over Liverpool or finding hidden stashes of money. I must have had ambition without realizing it, he mused.
a subconscious urge to get above people or out of a rut. But the odds didn't look good. Once when Lennon was a teenager, his headmaster forced him to produce a sheet of paper on which he was instructed to list some potential careers Lennon wrote, Salmon Fisherman. Though Paul seemed to have benefited from his Liverpool Institute education, the rest of the Beatles were facing the likelihood of spending their lives in low wage, low prestige vocations. As Robert Kreisgau has suggested, the Beatles loved rock and roll at least partly because rock and roll was a way to make it. The Stones burned with ambition, too, but not because they were desperate. If White Arby had never caught on in England, and the Stones had never escaped London's dingiest clubs, it still would not have been impertinent for Brian Jones or Mick Jagger to hope that they might become stereotypically successful. Granted, it's hard to imagine Keith Richards doing anything besides playing rock guitar, but considering the British class system, as a teenager his prospects were always a bit better than those of the Beatles. Fortunately for the Stones, they didn't have to grind it out for years playing in slummy bars the way the Beatles did otherwise they would never have made it. Jagger would have ditched the band to finish his education, and as a unit, the Stones were never friendly or trusting enough with each other to stay bonded for a prolonged, frustrating period. After the Beatles pride open a tremendous market for British bands, the Stones rose to fame comparatively quickly as the anti-Beatles. For the most part, the two bands were friendly toward each other. Especially early on, the Beatles were helpful to the Rolling Stones, and the Rolling Stones were grateful. But as the Stones began burning up the charts, the Beatles couldn't help but recognize that their act was, as George put it, more like, what, we'd done before we got out of our leather suits to try to get on record labels and television. And while it might have been ludicrous for the Beatles to be truly jealous of anyone, there's little doubt that if they thought they could have reached the toppermost of the poppermost without having to smile, bow, and wear suits, they'd have leapt at the opportunity. Meanwhile, the Stones seemed to envy the Beatles' success more than their music. Sure, they were very creative, but somehow they seemed to regard it all as a joke and it was, Jagger later said. The Beatles were so ridiculously popular, it was so stupid. They never used to play they just used to go on making so much bread, it was crazy. Musically, Richards said, we saw no connection between us and the Beatles. We were playing blues they were writing pop songs dressed in suits. Furthermore, the fact that the Beatles emerged from a Liverpool must have seemed stupefying to the Stones. For the first time, London had been left out in the cold till the very last minute, a British writer remarked, but it was way more than that. When the Beatles were at the peak of their success, the poet Allen Ginsberg said, they briefly made Liverpool the centre of the consciousness of the human universe. Eventually both groups would become settled enough in their success that they wouldn't worry so much about manipulating the media. In 1966, the Beatles even decided they'd had enough of their silly fan magazine, and so they stopped providing Sean O'Mahony with the access, interviews, and photographs he needed to keep the Beatles' book afloat. But O'Mahony would not be deterred so easily. In response to the Beatles' new attitude, he phoned his lawyer and called for a meeting. Epstein likewise showed up with his solicitor, plus two more advisors, and he matter-of-factly told O'Mahony it was time to wind down his publication of the Beatles' book. Asked for an explanation, he replied, they feel you don't tell the truth. You're not reporting them as they are. Dot. Omar and he exploded with anger, said Epstein's biographer, the truth. What do you mean? Do you mean for example when we were in Blackpool, John Lennon flinging open the window of the dressing room and shouting to the fans below, fuck off and buy more records? Was that the level of revelation Epstein and the Beatles expected from their authorized mouthpiece? Should the Beatles be reported as they really were, or were there no-go areas? A brief silence fell over the room, after which the two parties were able to proceed amicably enough to reach an agreement. Omar and he continued publishing the Beatles book until December 1969 and then he revived it in 1976 and kept going until 2003. Though Omoni labored to keep the Beatles' images up to date, he went about his work delicately. 
always refraining from saying too much about the controversies in which the group became embroiled. To adopt a sharper or more discerning approach would, said Omar Ani, be like shooting myself in the foot. Instead, he presented the Beatles as gentlemen. Chapter 2 Shit, that's the Beatles. The Beatles played Liverpool's Cavern Club for the 292nd time, and for the last time, on August 3, 1963. They brought home a pound 300 that night, and according to the club's legendary compa Tilda Diarasis Re, Bob Wooler, they put on a rip roaring show, a bit reminiscent of the very first time they performed there for only a pound five. Inside the venue, it was so sticky hot that the cavern's electricity blew, and the show was interrupted as the club's owner rushed to repair a fuse. Still, the fans loved it, he said. It was such a marvelous scene. It was also, however, a bittersweet occasion. The Beatles had obviously outgrown the cramped, dingy venue, and although Brian Epstein tried to reassure Wooler that someday his boys would be back, privately, he must have known that was unlikely. By then the Beatles' debut album, Please Please Me, was resting comfortably atop England's hit parade, where it would remain for 30 weeks, and the group, now residing permanently in London, was growing accustomed to headlining national tour packages. In the nation's weekly pop periodicals, they received gushing praise in teeny bopper magazines. They appeared on color pin-up posters, and in an extraordinary effort to satisfy eager requests from every studio executive, disc jockey, newsman, photographer, and club owner who wanted something from them, under Epstein's direction, the four lads from Liverpool were working almost to the point of burnout. Even if the Beatles had found time in their frenzied schedule to play another homecoming show at the Cavern, Epstein probably would not have al. loaded. Henceforth, he declared, the group would play only in proper theatres with elevated stages. The new policy was necessary in order to prevent the Beatles from being overrun by a scrum of frenzied fans. Perhaps inevitably, with their staggering success, the Beatles began spawning imitators, or, in early 60s British parlance, copyists. About two months after they performed at the Cavern for the last time, Pop fans could find on newsstands an issue of Melody Maker that contained an article headlined, Boiling Beatles Blast Copycats. John Lennon, identified as the group's spokesman, is quoted extensively throughout the piece, yet none of his remarks are challenged or contextualized, and in this way, the item has something of the flavor of a press release. But even if the Beatles press officer, Tony Barrow, was primarily responsible for the item, he still would have needed Lennon's permission before putting it out, and Lennon was clearly rankled by bands that were aping the Beatles' style and sensibility. Certain groups are doing exactly the same thing as us. Dot. Pinching our arrangements, he complained, and down to the last note, at that. But it wasn't just that certain bands were trying to ride the Beatles' coattails by mimicking their outfits and nicking their arrangements. To crown it all, Lennon carped. Other groups are climbing on this rhythm and blues bandwagon. Dot. By doing stuff we were playing two years ago, that is, American RB covers by the likes of Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly, which the Beatles used to pound out in grimy bars and run of the mill dance halls. The article continued, and in a final blast, an angry Lennon said, It happens in hairstyles as well. I see players in some groups even have the same length hair as us. It's no good them saying they're students and they just happen to have long hair. We were students, as well, before we came to London and we didn't have these styles then, did we? Lennon added, I suppose people might say it's an honor to be copied, and I wouldn't have bothered to have hit back really. But when they have a dig at us, we're going to have a go. I've wanted to say this for a long time. Dot. The notion that Merseyside acts like the Beatles were at odds with the groups coming out of London had been gaining traction. When a pop journalist asked Brian Jones about the Liverpool-London controversy, however, Jones replied sharply, it's all a load of rubbish. We are on very friendly terms with the Northern Beat groups and there's a mutual admiration between us. Many years later, in his scrap book come memoir, Stone Alone. Bill Wyman said it was a popular misconception. Dot. That we were at war with the Beatles. In reality, 
He maintained, the two groups were always bonded by mutual respect. It was just the newspapers that always fueled the idea that the two groups were rivals. And in his celebrated memoir, Life, Keith Richards said it was always a very friendly relationship between the Beatles and the Stones. The Beatles frequently echoed these sentiments. In August 1964, at an American press conference, Ringo called the Stones very good friends of ours, and Paul added, we hear some ridiculous rumors over here. Dot. Like, other Beatles hate every other group on the face of the earth. It's just not true. At another press event a few days later, John said about the Stones, I know it sounds daft, us liking them, but we're good friends. And in 1968, he said flatly, our rivalry was always a myth. Among music mavens, this has long been the conventional wisdom, while the press was busy making invidious comparisons between the Beatles and the Stones, the two groups remained above the fray, bonded by their mutual admiration, shared experiences, and obvious enjoyment of each other's company. The supposed rivalry between the Beatles and the Stones was a media creation, a folk controversy that arose from a press that was either base in its sensationalism or fanciful in its ignorance. But if all of that is the case, who was it that Lennon was itching to hit back in October 1963? He never mentioned any names, but he clearly had a specific target in mind. He was thinking about a band that was now playing RB of the type that the Beatles played in Hamburg and he seemed particularly peeved at a newer, London-based group made up at least partly of students, whose members refused to attribute their hairstyles to the Beatles' influence. Instead, they disingenuously maintained that they just happened to have long hair. Only one group fits the bill exactly. In the Rolling Stones official biography, Record Mirror reporter Peter Jones, writing under the alias Peter Goodman, describes a period in 1963 when the Beatles were high in the charts and reporters were very interested to know if the Rolling Stones hairstyles had owed anything to the high-riding Liverpool group. But whenever Jagger was asked about the provenance of their shaggy hairdos, he turned defensive, with his hands on his hips and his sweater awry as his shoulders gesticulated angrily, he replied. Art students have had this sort of haircut for years even when the Beatles were using hair cream. I sense I sense I sense. A Hollywood adage holds, it can take a lifetime to become an overnight success. Of course, it didn't take the Beatles nearly that long they managed to hit it big when they were still very young. Before they became household names, however, they paid their proverbial dues. Lennon and McCartney began their musical friendship on July 6, 1957, at a garden fete in Liverpool. Five more years would pass before the Beatles started recording with Emmy. In between came all of the failed auditions and talent show competitions, the late night sets in West German nightclubs, and the difficult personnel changes that endure so vividly in Beatles lore. It was rather different for the Stones. In July 1962, the band's nucleus of Brian, Mick, and Keith shared a stage for the first time almost a year to the day later, they appeared on British national television as Decca recording artists. Their first big break came in February 1963, when they secured a residency at the Crawdaddy Club at the Station Hotel, sometimes called the Railway Hotel, in Richmond, Surrey perhaps 30 minutes outside of central London by train. The Crawdaddy's manager was Giorgio Gomolsky, a Soviet-born, Swiss-educated London transplant who in the 1950s had been a mainstay of the local jazz club scene. Then in the early 1960s, Gomolsky started promoting Raw RB first in central London and then on the outskirts. Brian Jones had been bending my ear constantly about the possibility of landing gigs for the Stones, Gomelsky remembers. He had that little speech impediment kind of a lisp. It used to be part of his charm. A come and lie them to us, Giorgio, he'd plead with me. A oh, Giorgio, please get us some gigs. As. After catching a Stones performance at Sutton's Red Lion Pub. Gomelsky was suitably impressed but he couldn't offer them work immediately, since he'd already committed to promoting the David Hunt Band, a promising but unreliable Soho-based group. Listen, Gomelsky says he told the Stones, I promised this guy a job, 
but the first time he goofs, you're in. Sure enough, the very next week, Hunt's band failed to show up for one of their regularly scheduled gigs, and Gomelski turned their Sunday night slot over to the Stones. Bill Wyman says that when the Stones played their first Crawdaddy gig, they drew a crowd of about 30. But Gomelski recalls that snow fell heavily in London that night, a rare thing, and only three people showed up. He added that the diminished attendance might also have been accounted for, at least in minor part, by the transposition error in the flyers that he had illegally pasted all across town. Sunday night. 7.30 p.m. Rhythm and Pulse Gomelski shrewdly understood that the Stone's real problem, however, was that they had yet to build up an audience for grassroots a in London. Fortunately, he had a plan. He was the kind of guy where you could go round to his apartment, have some very strong coffee, smoke some sobranies, and map out plots, because he was very plugged into the club scene. Keith Richards recalled. He advised the Stones that instead of hustling for gigs at every opportunity, they should focus on building their reputation with their regular Sunday night performances. Once word got around, and with the right kind of promotion, he predicted that audiences would be flocking to see them. Gomelski says that Brian walked up to him that first night at the Crawdaddy and said, I saw Giorgio, there's six of us and three of them. Do you think it's worthwhile? Should we play? A.S. I said, A. Hey Brian, how many people do you think can fit in here? A hundred? Okay, well then play as if there were a hundred people in here. And they did. And that was one of the reasons I rarely went to see the Stones in later times, because in some ways, that was like the best show they ever did. For three people. Very quickly, Gomelski's prediction proved accurate and the Stones were playing to a packed house every Sunday night. To get inside, you had to queue in line, sometimes for hours. Once you got through the door, you found a smallish room that was pitch dark, save for the tiny stage, on which the Stones performed beneath two small spotlights, one red, one blue. Drawing heavily from the nearby Kingston College of Art, early audiences consisted predominantly of young men. As pop historian Alan Clayson explains, some among them detected a certain Neanderthal epata la bourgeoisie in the group, and came to understand that this rugged type of pop music was a uncommercial, and thus an antidote to the contrived splendor of television pop idols. Others in the crowd didn't even necessarily identify as RB fans. Groups of mods started showing up, decked in tweed jackets, high-heeled boots, and choke collar shirts, and so too came their supposed enemies, leather clad rockers. Before long, brawls between the two subcultures would lead to some sensational news stories in England, but not a single fight broke out while the Stones were playing at the Crawdaddy.